The following Women's Spaces show was recorded on Monday, July 4th, 2022. The woman in your life will do what she must do to comfort you and calm you down and let you rest now. The woman in your life, she can rest so easily. She does everything you Hello, everybody, and welcome to Women's Spaces. My name is Elaine B. Holtz, and I'm your host. With me at the board is my friend, my partner, my engineer, and co-producer, Ken Norton. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. What a beautiful day it is here in Sonoma County. A little bit cool, but that makes it more livable, I think. Anyway, joining me on the phone this morning will be Dr. Harriet Fraud. Dr. Fraud is a mental health counselor and hypnotherapist in practice in New York City. She is a well-published author and writes about the pressures on families and the economics of the United States of America. She is also a regular guest of Dr. Richard Wolf and his show Economics Update, which is on KBBF 89.1 FM every Tuesday from 11 to 12 p.m. I'm really excited about this show, a little bit nervous because we're going to be handling a pretty heavy topic. For this show, we will be doing, we will be talking about Roe versus Wade and some of the implications around this recent uh, Supreme Court decision to overthrow this 50-year-old president, God, you know, giving women control over their bodies and control of whether or not they desire to have a child. This decision is rested in her own hands and not the government, which has suddenly changed. I mean, it's really interesting. This decision before all this rigmarole that's happening now, the decision was in her own hands. You know, and there's a lot to talk about, a lot to to explore and also a lot to understand and one of the things I want to encourage the women out there listening you have to write your uh, congressmen your senators uh, you have to uh, pay attention to your local people and also uh, California is going to put on the on the ballot uh, to legalize abortion here in the state and you know we really need to pay a lot of attention to the things that are going on and above all in November we have to vote Voting is very important. And do research. You know, abortion is a very emotional issue, and you're going to see a lot of, of emotional ads. And it, it's it's really interesting to me, this whole struggle. I mean, I remember when abortion became legal, and I remember when I was a counselor working with young women and all of a sudden having to have an abortion because an accident happened. And it was amazing how simple it was. And now it's become so complicated. I wish they would debate wars. I wish they would debate poverty. I wish they would debate lack of Medicare and Medi-Cal and medical coverage for our citizens in lieu of all this debate around abortion. I mean, it seems to me that they're not pro-life, they're pro-fetus. And when life comes out, there's nothing for them. I mean, it's, it's very, very interesting when you start thinking about it. Well, today is July 4th, Independence Day, which is interesting. It looks like we're, as women, we're slowly losing our independence. I mean, you know, at one time, in order for you to even get birth control, your husband had to sign a paper in the doctor's office. I mean, that actually happened to me when birth control first came out. My husband had to go to the doctor with me and sign a paper that I could actually have birth control which was such a relief not to have to worry about getting pregnant. And now they're starting to say that they're going to threaten that. You know, we already are overpopulated on the planet. Do we need more people? I mean, that was one of the greatest gifts women got was birth control. Read out Angela's Ashes and you'll understand what I am talking about. Well, the 4th of July, I will tell you a little bit about this, also known as Independence Day or July 4th, has been a federal holiday in the United States since 1941. But the tradition of Independence Day celebration goes back to the 18th century and the American Revolution. And, you know, just a little bit of history. On July 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress voted in favor of independence. And two days later, delegates from the 13 colonies adopted the Declaration of Independence, a historic document, uh, 
drafted by Thomas Jefferson. From 1776 to the present day, July 4th has been celebrated as the birth of American independence, with festivities ranging from fireworks, parades, and concerts to more casual uh, family gatherings and barbecues. The 4th of July... 2022 is today, Monday. It was really, really exciting. I love when we have shows on the holiday and we can kind of integrate it with what we're talking about. Well, you know, as I talk about things every Monday, uh, our history is our strength. And something, another very interesting thing happened on July 4th, and it was the 100th anniversary, so it was 1876. And that was on July 4th, 1876, suffragettes, crashed the centennial celebration in Independence Hall to present the vice president with the Declaration of the Rights of Women. The Declaration of the White Rights of Women. Amazing when you start thinking about it. Well, so what happened was uh, Philadelphia, it was July 4th, 1876. The celebration kicked off the nation's 100th birthday celebration to a large, enthusiastic crowd. Among those in the city uh, for the festivities was the National Women's Suffrage Association, the NWSA, an organization founded in 1869 to advocate for constitutional amendment uh, ensuring that women had the right to vote. The NWSA planned to participate uh, in the uh, centennial event by presenting their Declaration of Rights of the Women of the United States to the Nation. The Declaration of Rights of the of Women of the United States on July uh, 4, 1876, this declaration was written by Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and Elizabeth Caddy Stanton on behalf of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Well, that's a mouthful. It's a lot, a lot to, to talk about here. And despite hostility and ridicule, remember that, despite uh, uh, humiliation, you know, of these women and a lot of hostility, the Women's Declaration said, we, there, we therefore, women of the United States of America, do solemnly publish and declare that we are by nature and of right ought to be by law free and independent citizens possessing equal political power with our brother men. And they were demanding the right to vote. And what's, what's really interesting is that the declaration was, uh, was uh, something that happened in France. Let me, just, let me just get this out here. What happened, there was a woman in, uh, in, in France uh, by the name of... Mm, I can't find that right now. Well, I'll just, I'll have to skip that right now. But anyway, the idea came from the French Revolution and also that the Fren during the French Revolution, women were also rising. And believe it or not, when women were rising during the French uh, Revolution, they were going to the guillotines because they did not want them to have a voice. They were complaining, actually complaining about the revolution because there was no room for women. And I found this very interesting thing that my... Uh, I have a sister-in-law by the name of Valerie Renee, who's a very, uh, she's, a, she's a, a researcher. She does a lot of research. And she came across this, this great thing about uh, from Abigail Adams to John Adams. And this was written in March 31st, 1776, 100 years prior to when the women, uh, the suffragettes were protesting and saying that women, they wanted the right to equality and the right to vote. And this is what Abigail Adams wrote to John Adams. And they were writing the uh, Declaration of Independence and doing certain things, trying to bring the country together. Here we go. I long to hear that you have declared an independency and by the way, the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, comma, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Very interesting. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Rem this is so interesting. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. Boy, ain't that the truth. All men could be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to format a rebellion. 
and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws which we do not have a voice or representation. Well, as you know, even to her husband, <laughs> that little statement was ignored. You know, that letter was ignored because women had no rights. You know, in fact, in the church, they were even said to be silent. I mean, we've come a long way. We really have come a long way, particularly in the last 50 years. And to think that it's being gutted, you know, and there's so much controversy around it. You know, and, and a, a, an election's coming up in no, November. We have to be careful of who we put into office. You know, there was actually another thing that Valerie sent me. It was about a woman who went to a, an abortion clinic. It was very interesting. This woman was protesting abortions. She was literally protesting them and all of a sudden found herself pregnant and wanted an abortion, was very scared that nobody, she didn't want anybody to find out about it. And she tells the doctor, you know, I'm not pro-choice. She says, but I can't handle this pregnancy. Now that does not make any sense to me. And I think that the women out there who are against abortion, against pro-choice, need to start thinking about what are they against? You know, if you don't want to have an abortion, it is your choice. It is your choice to be able to do that. You know, to me, it's almost like saying, you know, when I go to the supermarket, there's all kinds of foods and all kinds of different things that I can choose from. It's the same thing with that aspect of our, of our lives. If this is something that we need to do, it's our own business. It's not the government's business. It's nobody's business. Only between you I guess the person who got you pregnant and also God, the higher power, however you see it. It, it's not, it should not be government. Government should not be into our bodies. I mean, these are our bodies. We are a sovereign nation. That means our bodies are our bodies. And we need to really look at that. We really need to look at why do they want to take control over their bodies in this fashion? You know, they're saying they want to protect the fetus. I mean, it was so interesting. There was a, a, a slip at a, at a rally that, uh, of, uh, I can't remember the state right now, where a woman actually said that it was really happy that President Trump was, uh, in the, was the one that encouraged this because he put all these different Supreme Court justices in. And she said, I guess it's to, uh, it's to uh, preserve the white race. Well, then she kind of caught it, track, backtracked and said, no, she meant life. And so, it, you know, it was a little bit of a slip, but something you know, can't help but wonder if that isn't on their mind, especially with all this stuff about replacement, like they think that the white people are going to be pla replaced with people of color. You know, we really have to look at what we're thinking here and what we're doing when it comes to rights. Because once we lose this right, there's a lot of other rights. You know, I've been doing a lot of research and trying to understand the 14th Amendment. And what I'm seeing, and when Harriet and I have this discussion, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of laws that are really affected by Roe versus Wade. And we'll talk about that. It's not just this one simple thing, no abortion. There's all kinds of rights that are on the chopping board now, and we really need to be careful. And if you don't think we need to be careful, you know, do some research on what it's like to live in a fascist country where all of a sudden there's a dictator and every decision is made for you and people are killed that they that you don't agree that they don't agree with you. I mean, this it's there's just a lot to think about. Well, I want to do one more, Our History is Our Strength, and wish this woman a happy birthday. Uh, she's made her transition. She was born July 5th, 1899, and she passed away in 1990. Her name was Anna Hedgeman. She was a civil rights activist and educator, first American, first African-American woman to serve in the cabinet of the New York, uh, in the New York mayor's office from 1954 to 1958 and she helped plan the 1963 march on washington and that was the big march when uh, martin luther king uh, did that wonderful uh, presentation i have a dream well happy birthday anna hedgeman and thank you for all that you contributed and thank all the women out there that contributed i mean we've come a long way in the last 50 years i mean women are are in office now we have women all across the country that are running for office right now uh, we have women doctors women lawyers i mean we can get credit cards and we can vote and we can vote we just had an election here in Sonoma County, and a, a real positive candidate lost by 422 votes. 
That means if 422 more people would have got out there and, and expressed their privilege to vote, then maybe things would be a little bit different. But people just sit back. You know, I don't understand it. They sit back. You know, one, of the, one rule I have, if you complain and you didn't vote, I don't want to hear about it. I really don't. Well, we're going to take a little musical break right now. And the song I will be playing is another Sandy Rap song. And she did two powerful songs about abortion. This one is Where Were the Flowers? This song is a perfect for the topic of the show. So when I return, I will be in conversation with Dr. Harriet Fraud. We'll be talking about Roe versus Wade, what it entails, and some of the implications around the recent uh, court, uh, Supreme Court decision to overthrow this 50-year-old president. Dr. Harriet Fraud, who is a mental health counselor and hypnotherapist in practice in New York, and she is one of the founding members of the Women's Liberation Movement in New Haven, Connecticut. Anyway, let's go ahead, Ken. Let's go ahead and play a uh, Sandy Rap song now. Where were the flowers we all wanted to know? We were the flower children long time ago. Someone took the flowers and went marching up the hill. Now roses take many lives, but flowers weren't meant to kill. How many years we wondered, long time ago, we was looking for the answers. Where the four winds blow Most winds are friendly Flower children can tell A chill wind from Washington Took young Rebecca Bell They say life, they want control they want your body and your mind and your soul How many lives, how many roads Till we take back the bread and the rose Becky was a youngster Born in Indiana State Afraid to tell her parents of a choice that she had made But the laws were written And the judges RTL So to a backstreet hack Went young Rebecca Bell They say life, they want control They want your body and your mind and your soul how many lives, how many roads Till we take back the bread and the rose I have a hammer It belonged to Becky Bell And she had a story Which now the angels tell so she writes it on the night wind And she sings it in your dreams We are the people And the children must be free They say life, they want control They want your body and your mind and your soul How many lives, how many roads we take back the bread and the rose They say life, they want control They want your body and your mind and your soul How many lives, how many roads Till we take back the bread and the rose 
my goodness, that is such a powerful song. Sandy, if you're out there listening, thank you so much for writing these very, very powerful lyrics. And thank you. Last last week, I played a song called Remember Rose, which is another impacting song. Well, folks, for you just joining in, I want to remind my listeners the opinions expressed here are not necessarily the opinions of the station, its board of directors, its members, or women's spaces. Well, welcome back. You're listening to Women's Spaces, and I'm your host, Elaine B. Holtz. And without further ado, I want to introduce my guest joining me on the phone from New York, and it's an honor to introduce her. And I like to think of her one of my regulars here on Women's Spaces, Dr. Harriet Fraud. Welcome, Harriet. Welcome to Women's Spaces once again. I'm so glad to be here. It's an honor and a joy. Well, I, I especially we're going to be talking about the hot topic of the day, which is the reversal of Roe versus Wade. But before we before we get into it, can I just tell our listeners just a little bit about you? Sure. And anything that I leave out or when you want to add, please be my guest. Dr. Fraud is a founding mother of the Women's Liberation Movement in New Haven, Connecticut, and has been an activist for her entire life. She is a mental health counselor and hypnotherapist in practice in New York City. She is the founding member of the journal Rethinking Marxism for over... Uh, 40 years. She has been a radical committed to transforming U.S. personal and political life. Harriet specializes in speaking and writing about topics in which psychology and economics overlap, as these topics remain loaded with taboos, confusions, ignorance, and fear, preventing us from asking big questions and daring to discuss the answer. She believes by analyzing issues where psychology and economics collide, we can better analyze our society and our individuality as well. She is an author of several books, which includes Imagine Living in a Socialist USA, uh, Personal, Emotional, and Sexual Life Without Capitalism, that she wrote with her daughter, Tess Fraud. Well, welcome, Harriet. Welcome to Women's Spaces. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, I have two podcasts and a radio program. One podcast is by myself. It's called Capitalism Hits Home, about capitalism and the impact on our personal lives. Another one is with Liam Tate and Ikoi Hiro, and it's called It's Not Just in Your Head, about social forces affecting our psychology. And I have a radio program on WBAI in New York City, and it's called Interpersonal Update. And I'm really glad to be here, Elaine, and to talk about this in very, very urgent topic with you. Well, you're definitely a very, very busy woman. Well, let, let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, what's kind of happening. You know, when I look at the world, you know, this whole thing around abortion, and at the same time, 19 children were killed in Texas, and the Supreme Court you know, just ruled that you can carry concealed guns in New York. It became the law of the land there. Then overturning Roe versus Wade, a 50-year-old president giving women the right to privacy. And then also the threat of all kinds of other things happening, plus the disruption of the uh, Supreme Court by what's happening with Clarence and Ginny Thompson. Uh, Thomas, so can, can you kind of talk about that? What do you think is going on? Why, why is this happening here in 2022? Well, what I think is going on, as I looked at nine out of the ten decisions of the recent Supreme Court, they all lead to taking away individual rights, most dramatically women's right over one of the basic systems functioning in our bodies, our reproductive systems, state control of people and total state control so the CIA can torture you and you don't even find out the details of where you were tortured, no less outlawing torture, and taking away every protection that interferes with profit so that the EPA doesn't have the right to control emissions. They can keep making money while people can't breathe and get cancer. How we we really don't have privacy over our own bodies, another right, taking away basic, basic rights, the most basic rights. And so I think it's really about setting up a society in which 
the government has no laws protecting people so that the gun laws you can carry a gun everywhere and the gun industry as represented by the NRA can sell more and more guns even though more and more people are killed every day and another one is taking away the separation of church and state and enforcing the kind of religions that enforce the lines of domination and subordination and people hope putting their hopes in the future and in prayer and God instead of in human beings here on earth acting together. This is a very fascistic program and it's a warning to all of us. It's most dramatic aspect because it takes away a whole system that makes us human beings or reproductive systems is of course abortion rights. Well, and it's, it's done under the cloak of justice. It's amazing. It's the opposite. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's amazing when you put everything together and you see what's going on, all the rights that are been, being taken away. And then when you look at some of the polls, there's not an agreement. <laughs> you know, people don't want to lose these rights. You know, no. it, it's kind of frustrating. Well, let's let's get into Roe versus Wade. Let me just give you a little statement here, and then maybe you could answer. What do you think? What do you think is really motivating it right now? I mean, particularly why? You know, one of the things that in the Sandy Rap song, if you hear if you heard one of the lines, yeah. she says, "We want to. They want to own you, mind, body, and soul." You know what? You know here. Here's Roe versus Wade. It was a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court ruled that. The Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive without excessive government restriction. The decision was struck down by the by the U.S. Supreme uh, Federal Court and state abortion laws. I mean, it's just it's just amazing. What what are your thoughts about what is motivating all this during this time in our history? Uh, particularly when you start thinking about you know, there's so much fear about the replacement. I mean, there was a woman that actually gave some sort of a speech introducing uh, uh, President Trump, and she accidentally, because she she apologized, ladies. Later, she says protecting the white race, and she said she meant to say life. And so, but this still, that was that slip. So, what do you think? What are your thoughts? What is motivating uh, this stuff during this time in our history? Well, I think one of the things that's happening in our history is the United States has to make an adjustment. It is no longer the American century. We have lost four wars, and now we're losing the proxy war in Ukraine. And we are not any longer the fastest growing. China is. We have more people going into poverty. They have 880 million people who are no longer poor, and they are now reaching for common prosperity. We're no longer the most powerful country in the world, bar none. No one has to listen to us. They called a big African conference of all the African nations. Only four showed up. They called the Organization of American States together. At least a third of them didn't show. And what the impulse is, a kind of fascistic return, as Hitler wanted to make Germany great again, they want to make America the 1950s great again when all the other world powers were destroyed, and we were powerful. And that time we were a white supremacist, male supremacist, racist nation, and they want to reinsert male supremacy through abortion and white supremacy through destroying rights and opportunities for the mass of people to be protected and to live. I mean, stopping pollution... The neighborhoods that are most polluted are where poor people live and where a disproportionately number of black people live so that you're taking away their permission to breathe and not get cancer. So that there is this push where they think they can go back in time, even though the circumstances have totally changed, and restore America to the greatness and richness we had post-World War II when every other economy in the world, advanced countries, was destroyed. No, you have to accept that history changes and not try to restore the greatness, which included outrageous discrimination against 
people of color and against women. Oh, and and another thing that's so interesting, though, and going back to the 1950s, because that's when I was a teenager, my father was a union man. He made a decent salary. That's right. You know, and 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 also what was available is low interest uh, loans, so people could have. Of course, it was mainly targeted for the GIs came in back, but at least families could buy homes. You know, there was. You know, I could spend. I could spend twenty dollars for a mo- almost a month of food. You know, right. now it costs me over a hundred dollars a week. I mean, even more than that. I mean, it's just amazing. So, on some levels, you know, going back there, yeah, that might be a good idea. You know, gasoline was not twenty nine and nine ten cents a day a gallon. We all used to chip in twenty five cents and go for miles. You know, it was it was a, a different a different error. But it what, was. What, so you think that the motivation is, is, it sounds like, just like she says, they want to own you mind, body, and soul so they can move forward with their agenda. And it's interesting because I think of when Ronald Reagan, when he was speaking, says that government was the problem. Well, I agree with him. Government is the problem. But this is, this is the problem by coming in and taking away our rights. I mean, that's a big problem. Well, you know, why do you believe, you know, you know, now what, what I hear is happening, and, and, and is also with the EPA, with the environmental stuff, mm-hmm. is now what the, what the Supreme Court is saying, we're going to throw it back to the states. And right. one of the problems when they throw it back to the state is you have state one doing this, state two doing that, and before you know it, you've got so much confusion. You know, when you cross a border, it's one law, and you cross another border, it's another law. Why do you believe it's important to make it a, a federal law in lieu well, of all of this? Federal laws are always more protective of the majority, and of course we need government. I think Reagan did that because the best period of recent American history, where we won World War II, we in the Soviet Union at the time, was where we had a big, good government that gave us Social Security, unemployment insurance, a raft of other benefits, and the people at the top who were making money, hand over fist, didn't, they paid for those benefits. FDR taxed the top at 98, no, 96.8%. And they agreed because there was such a revolutionary movement of the mass of people that he could say, listen, uh, buddies, because he was very rich too, from an old rich family, if you don't agree to this, You'll have nothing. There'll be a revolution here. And so big government was our salvation. And they wanted to make it seem like government is the problem rather than the big companies that are controlling the government through their money. Well, you know, when you said that, all of a sudden what came to my mind is is that we didn't have NAFTA then. You know, we, we didn't. you know, we didn't have all these trade things. I mean, we, we were the, we were actually, we were, we were top, we were almost number one when it came to education and it came to manufacturing. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's really seems that there's been a consistent degeneration of, of mm-hmm. the, of, of our rights and government. And I want to just, I just want to talk a little bit here, just mention this a little bit and then. After I mention this, talk about how does overturning this law affect women and children currently? I mean, you know, it's it's really, it, it's a shock to me. I mean, because I remember walking for walking for this law, and uh, the Fourteenth Amendment is uh, is it says the due pro the due process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment to U.S. Constitution provides a fundamental right to privacy that protects a pregnant a pregnant woman's liberty to choose whether to have an abortion. This right is not absolute and must be balanced against the government's interest protecting the women's health, protecting the women's health and protecting prenatal life. The Texas law making it a crime to proceed, to to uh, to procure an abortion is has violated this right. So how how is that affecting women and children currently? Well, it's affecting them very dramatically. Just yesterday, there was a case of a raped. 10-year-old who was denied an abortion in Ohio, that it means sex abuse doesn't stop because, and it's rampant, most sex abuse happens below the age of 12, and so that it means that children who are impregnated by their rapists will be forced into term. It also means that because women can't afford a lot of unwanted children, there are women who are alone, the majority of women live by 
are single and are not necessarily supported, that means that they can't afford these children. And it also means that you will have all sorts of attempted abortions by people who are too poor to travel to another state or another country. Rich women have always been able to have abortions. Their private obstetrician suggests someone to have a safe abortion. It's scary if you have to leave and go to Puerto Rico or go to any number. Every other Western democracy has abortion rights. But it's scary, and you have to have money. So this means the mass of people who don't have the money, and we have to remember that 60% of Americans don't even have $400 in savings, that they will try to abort themselves by themselves coat hanger abortions, and hundreds, if not thousands, will die every year, leaving the children that they do have motherless and alone. Also, the Republicans who are behind this don't say anything about the increasing maternal death rate in childbirth or the increasing death rate of children because they're poor and they're not nourished enough. And the Republicans have opposed every increase that would help maternal safety and give children meals for free and milk money for free and after-school care and health care so that it's a very obvious ploy to restore to white men control over women that... Abortion bans combined with what were family wages for white men. Black men never had this, but and certainly white women didn't have it either, but family wages for white men so that they could command the full-time labor of a woman, taking care of them, doing their housework, their child care, their sex work, their emotional care, hooking up them with their emotions, their social care, entertaining their friends and relatives, and so on. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because I want to go back to what you said about women dying and the danger, you know, with the coat hanger abortions. I mean, right now that, that's becoming like you're seeing it all over the Facebook, all these different uh, coat hangers. Well, I, I actually had a family member, my aunt, had three children and had an experience where her husband had a mental breakdown and found herself pregnant. And we had to find her, you know, she wanted to have an abortion. So they call me because they think I know everybody. <laughs> so we found somebody. We found a, a young woman in a trailer court. I think she charged about $250. And this was, was, this was at about 1965, I think. And, uh, you know, they did the court hander thing, and then they tell, told us to go home, and it was, she was going to get cramps and have an abortion, and that would, you know, the baby would, the fetus would fall out, or however they explained it. And when she went into that kind of labor, all of a sudden she started bleeding. She almost bled to death. I mean, when, and when we called the emergency room, what they said, it sounds like an abortion, and if you come in, we're going to have to save the baby. And, uh, you know, I mean, we couldn't, we just, my mother and I were with her, and Finally, we got her to the. Finally, the fetus did abort, and we got her to the hospital. She had to have three transfusions, and she was lucky that she made it through. And here, she would have left three children behind, but she could not. There was no way she could. It was the stress of having this child, and also the stress and the belief of what would happen to this child coming into the world, where the family was so dis, you know, so disobligated at this time. So you know, it's it's no joke when you when you under if people understand that there is an absolute danger. And when you take somebody for an illegal abortion, you are really taking a chance with their life. So would you kind of agree with that? And anything else you'd like to add before we take a musical break? And I hope that you'll stay with me for the next half, Harriet. Is that okay? Of course I will. And also, if you go to an illegal abortionist, there is no guarantee of healthy, safe, sanitary conditions. So you are likely to get an infection and die from that because up inside of you, you have dirty tools, you know, and that, that was a big cause of death before the Roe versus Wade, that people would go to backstreet abortionists who didn't cost as much cause, and also 
they couldn't afford to leave the country because they didn't have the money or to go to a private person, and then they would get sepsis, body infections, and die. So we are basically, in order to give men control over women, we're risking women's health, and we are condemning hundreds, if not thousands, a year to death, and their children to be orphaned and unwanted and uncared for. Amazing. It's stunning. You know, I'm going to read you something before we take the break, just as something to think about while while you're listening to the song. I'm going to be playing a song called By My Silence, I Give My Consent. Mm. You know, that's why it's very important that women uh, speak out. Well, there was a decision made, and there there was a leaked draft, if you remember that, of the Supreme Court uh, on the opinion of overturning Roe versus Wade. And just as Samuel Alito wrote, the inescapable conclusion is that the right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. Yet abortions was so deeply rooted in colonial America that one of our nation's most influential architects, Benjamin Franklin, in 1748, went out of his way to insert into the most widely and enduringly read and reprinted math textbook of the colonial Americans. And he received so little pushback or outcry for the inclusion that historians have barely noticed it was there. Abortion was simply a part of life, as much as reading, writing, and arithmetic. And also, there is some, there is some information out there that the Puritans actually, they, they always put the woman first. So if there was a problem that they, there had to be like this poor little, I mean, 10 years old. I mean, her yeah. life is ruined. I mean, I mean, what an, ex- I mean, it's just enough, enough to drive you crazy. So we're going to see. enough that she was raped, but now that, that she has to go through this. It's very, very sad. So we're going to take a musical break, and the song we're going to be playing is By My Silence, I Give My Consent. And when we return, we will be continuing our conversation with Dr. Harriet Fraud. We're going to continue talking about Roy, Roe versus Wade and all the implications. So let's go ahead, Ken. Let's play that song. Oh. Communist, so when it came for the communists, I held my tongue Like a good neighbor, I minded my own business And trusted justice was done I didn't ask what was their crime It was their sadness, it was not mine I didn't care where they were sent By my silence, I gave my consent by my silence, I gave my consent I'm not Jewish, so when they came for the Jews I had nothing to say Branded with stars, herded like cattle into boxcars And then taken away I didn't ask, what was their crime? It was their sadness, it was not mine I didn't care where they were sent By my silence I gave my consent By my silence I gave my consent Your consent. 
By your silence you give your consent By my silence you gave my consent Yes, by my silence I give my success, my consent Very interesting line. I want to clarify something right here. Ken just brought up that maybe I didn't make this clear about Benjamin Franklin and his math book. There was a whole chapter dedicated to abortion, how to have an abortion, and the uh, different choices that you could make. So, Harriet, welcome back. And what is your thought about that statement? Find out that, that this has been going on so long. In fact, it wasn't until about uh, about 1920, I believe it was, or actually 18-something that the uh, AMA came into uh, existence, and that's when they first started having where, in order for a woman to have an abortion, she had to get a consent from her doctor. So what, 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 is, what is your thought about that statement about Benjamin Franklin? Franklin and not knowing about that. Well, I think most of us don't know because we're not taught it. What we're taught, and everybody knows who Benjamin Franklin was, but they don't look at the list of abort efficients, you know, the herbs and stuff that that he recommended so that people could have an abortion. You know, my own grandmother had several abortions. What she would do is go to the midwife. First, she didn't know about it. She was married at 17 and had three kids by the time she was 21 and realized, oh, no. Uh, but she went to, she found out you could just go to your local midwife, sit over a pot of steaming onions, and she'd give you an abortion. And steaming my onions? grandmother <laughs> had 13 abortions, okay? That was something they did. Abortion is not something new, but what... What this by taking away abortion, you take away a woman's control over her own body. Plus, you do what is specifically banned in the Constitution, which is cruel and unusual punishment. It is a cruel and unusual punishment to have to go through all the changes in your body to bring an unwanted fetus into the world as a baby. That kind of pregnancy is a cruel and unusual punishment and should be banned. But you know, it's interesting because people don't realize that even in pregnancy, you know, for example, I'll give you a good example. My mother during her time wanted to give my father a son. That was the big deal. So she went, she had two cesareans and had to get a third one. And they told her that she was risking her life. Okay. And I thought that was very, very, I remember I was eight years old, her telling me, you know, you got to take care of you know, of your, of, your, uh, of your brother and sister, if anything happens to me, which was very frightening. Well, my brother, who was the one who she was pregnant with, he came out and he was asthmatic because I, we believe that my mother was so traumatized and so frightened about this third child. So it was, it was just, it just, people don't realize what women go through, especially when you don't have that perfect situation where you have the perfect husband, the perfect house, and the perfect amount of money coming in. It's a right. whole, it's a whole different story. And, and I don't understand, you know, even with, you know, at the beginning of the show, I talked about the, my, uh, my sister-in-law sent me this information about this woman who, you know, all of a sudden she was protesting outside the abortion clinics and all of a sudden she gets pregnant and she comes in, she says, oh, I'm not pro-choice, but I can't handle this pregnancy. I mean, I, I, it just blew my mind. And another thing, too, you know, that I'd like you to talk about is that people don't recognize that other rights are on the board. And I just found three of them. And the three of them are the right to contraception. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? You know, and then the right to birth, you know, uh, in, to right to intimate relations and marriage equality to decide whether to bear a child again. You know, and also the woman having independence. And the right to, and the ability to appoint a health care proxy and refuse unwanted medical treatment. And I, when I looked at that unwanted medical treatment, it's almost like, you know, that your doctor becomes your God. You know, he's the one or she's the one that's going to make the decisions for you. And that, that in itself is dangerous. So what, what do you think about that? And do you see any other, any other rights that might be uh, uh, affected here? Yes, I do. I certainly see the right to breathe as affected and the, light, the right to live. Our right to live is directly threatened by the Second Amendment that allows anybody to carry a concealed weapon. And so if people are upset 
for some reason, and a lot of people are upset because these are terrible times in the United States. They can be uh, terribly upset and kill people. There have been mass a mass shooting, at more than one mass shooting every single day in the United States, where men, overwhelmingly, who are over, well, entirely men, who are overwhelmed in their lives and angry, just shoot people. So that is another thing. The right to life, the right to breathe, the right to be safe from COVID in the workplace, that they, uh, the mandate that people have to be able to be protected from COVID in the workplace, that's off. So that's another right to life that is threatened. What they're doing is they're calling it the right to life. What it is is forced birth because they're taking away the rights to life while they're in this abortion law. And so I think what they're doing is forced birth, and then they force a difference between men and women who can't unite together because women are basically prisoners of men. Only they've taken away the economic conditions of existence of women's dependency on men and families by taking away the male wages and exporting and computerizing, robotizing and mechanizing their jobs. Oh, so I... they can only get minimum wage jobs. And so that on every level they're disempowering the American people. Well, you and know, you know they're have... waking up, I hope. But to help this, you know, California right now is going to, is going to go to the ballot. They're going to, they want to amend the Constitution. They want to codify a, abortion. Well, there's talk about codifying abortion, privacy right. What does that mean, and how can, can they protect? I mean, if it's just in California, does that mean everybody's going to come in? What does it mean to codify a right, I mean, when they, when the, what they're doing? I mean, how can, they get, how can they actually get away with that? Well, I think they can't if there's a federal ban on all abortions, then they can't do that. Otherwise, if it, if it depends on the state, the state can guarantee the right to abortion. And they can also have a whole trade in people coming in for an abortion from other states, those people who can afford to travel and stay over somewhere else and take off from work and leave their children if they have them those people can come and get an abortion. Also, it's, they're taking away the right to life because the maternal death rate in the United States keeps going up. Abortions are much safer than childbirth. That's so and interesting. So that, that's another way that they are endangering our right to life. Well, let, let me ask you something. You mean to tell me that because Joe Biden just said that if they elect him as president, he's going to make a, he's going to make it illegal throughout the, you know, across the whole United States. Does that mean if Cali if 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 uh, California votes that to legalize abortion and to change it in their constitution that it, it becomes null and void? Well, Biden promises that abortion will be legalized. I mean, that's one of the things that he is running on, that abortion will be legal throughout the United States. Not that he has the power necessarily to do that within an obstructionist Republican Senate, but whatever, he, that's what he's promised. And I think that's a reasonable promise if he can figure out how to phrase the legislation in such a way that the Supreme Court, which is right wing now, can't undo it. But Biden is very passive. He doesn't fight back. He could change the Supreme Court. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh both lied under oath that they wouldn't touch the abortion law. Thomas, and of course they should be impeached for that, Thomas should be impeached for lying about his taxes, hiding $750,000, not recusing himself when he cases that his wife was involved in were up before the Supreme Court, and he always voted in favor of what she wanted. Wow. But these are grotesque ethical violations for which those judges should be impeached. And in addition, Biden has the power to appoint three more judges. Har Harriet, we're coming to the end of our segment here. The show is just, the clock is running us out, so... Oh. 
the last thing we need to do is if you can make some suggestions of what uh, when, what you think women should do, what are some of the things they should do or, or yes. some of the steps they should take, and also your, your website. Okay, my website is harrietfra.com, H-A-R-R-I-E-1-T, F-R-A-A-D dot com. And what we have to do is what the Argentinian women did to win abortion rights in a country that is overwhelmingly Catholic, unlike ours, and where the Pope himself went to try to stop abortion rights. They joined with the indigenous movement, with the labor movement, with the black liberation movements, with the climate movement, to win. And I think what we have to do is organize, get together, and unify so that we can win. Because you not, we are the mass of people. This is a small minority. 70% of the country is solidly behind abortions. And these people are a tiny mi- representing a tiny minority. We have to unify because we are the mass of people and need each other to win. And that's what we have to do. Join groups, press the abortion issue, and unify to win. Well, Dr. Fodd, I couldn't have said it any better. And Harriet, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being such a wonderful guest here on Women's Spaces and wishing you much success in all you do. Well, that's it for our show. A special thank you to Dr. Harriet Fraud. And a reminder, tell your friends that Women's Spaces will be aired again at 11 p.m. this evening. This is Elaine B. Holtz with Women's Spaces. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to being with you the next time. The previous Women's Spaces show was recorded on Monday, July 4th, 2022.